<clears throat> this is Sunday. We're at the Oregon Air Fair, <clears throat> and um, I'm doing a little lead-in tape here, kind of practice uh, to see if uh, Tim's. Uh, we're going to tape Tim's speech. Pan over here to the Tex Rankin exhibit. We've got photographs and um, and of course we got the fuselage and the great banner. More photographs. There's one of our directors, Peter Stack. And there's the man himself, Tim Talon. He's going to give us a talk at 11 o'clock all about Tex. Handsome dude. There's Al Grill. This big blue back here, I think, is Will Heath. You can always tell that from the back. He never turns around, so you can see his front, but I'm sure that's who that is. There's our beacon. Good <clears throat> morning. My name is Tim Talon. I'm a member of the Board of Directors on the Oregon Aviation Museum. <clears throat> And if you've been out to our booth out there, you know that there's an airplane uh, structure sitting there. And this morning's little talk involves that airplane and the two special pilots who flew that aircraft. And it really starts about 66 years ago when the Great Lakes Aircraft Corporation built an airplane, as they were wont to do in those days. Um, and this particular airplane came off the assembly line as NC-315Y. And to all appearances, it had, you know, the typical paint scheme, orange wings and a cream fuselage and all the markings of a standard-looking Great Lakes aircraft. But on second look, you, you noticed that there were extra wires, a few extra braces here and there, a couple of other little subtle changes that made this a, a particularly unique and special aircraft. And it was obvious that this aircraft was not built just for the standard flight training and uh, flight around the patch type uh, use. It had perhaps a more special purpose. The other unique thing about it was that as soon as they had it built, they did something most unusual. Remember, this is 1931, the Depression. Times are tough. Money's a little short. What did they do? They gave the airplane away. Not too many manufacturers were willing to give something away. But they had something special in mind with this. They gave the airplane, by the way, to a 20-year-old girl, a rather shy, quiet girl from Portland, Oregon, and her name was Dorothy Hester. And really, that's the beginning of our story. Dorothy Hester, of course, was a Portland girl, um, got interested in flying, saw airplanes going over, saved up some money, jumped on the streetcar, got out to Rankin's Field, and paid for an airplane ride. And as soon as she got down, and maybe even before she got down, she said, I want to be a pilot. That's what I want to do. And so it wasn't but a few days later that she enrolled in the Rankin School of Flying. And of course, Tex Rankin School here in Portland was one of the largest, biggest uh, flying schools um, in the nation. At one time, I think he had more students than any other flying school. And of course, Tex was famous already for his air show work, his cross-country races that he had performed in or had competed in and uh, endurance flights and a number of other activities in which uh, Tex had, had become famous. So Dorothy started taking flying lessons and it was, it was obvious right from the start 
uh, not only did she have a good flight instructor, who, by the way, was Elroy Jepson, uh, she also uh, showed her mark by when, as was typical, they would go through four or five lessons and then have something like a check ride. And so she got to fly with Tex on several occasions during her training period. And every time he was quite amazed at how well she was doing, what a good pilot she was, and um, perhaps the other uh, natural thing that, that was needed in a great aerobatic pilot was that kind of fearlessness that's necessary to do the things you need to do uh, when you're doing aerobatics. It, it might be noted that maybe the reason that uh, Dorothy took to flying so much was that in order to pay for her flying lessons, she did the only thing that uh, young ladies at that time could make a bunch of money doing, and that was parachute jumping. She became one of the first parachute, lady parachute jumpers here on the West Coast. She did about four or five of these jumps, just enough, really, to pay for her flying lessons. And so I, I would suspect that doing loops and rolls and flying in this Great Lakes biplane was pretty easy stuff after doing a few parachute jumps, and back in those days it was a crude uh, operation and a rather perilous thing. You never knew where you were going to come down. But uh, Dorothy had the mark for all of this and uh, could do it. As soon as she had soloed and got a few hours in, Tex started flying with her, and he immediately started doing some of the other uh, unusual attitude uh, things that are typical of uh, an aerobatic pilot who wants to train someone, and she became very familiar with loops and rolls, and then as, as she progressed, Tex continued to, to feed her these extra more difficult maneuvers. Pretty soon she was doing uh, outside snap rolls, and uh, he taught her to do the um, inverted spin. Uh, and eventually, by the time she was about 19 or 20 years old, she was probably the first woman to accomplish the outside loop, and uh, which was a, a stunning feat. There weren't that many men who could do an outside loop, much less a woman. And uh, so, and it was during that period of time when, of course, records were uh, being made and broken, and some of them were in dubious categories. But nonetheless, the outside loop record was was one of these. And Tex uh, immediately went out during this time and and set a record uh, by doing. I think his first record that he set was like 78 outside loops, which was quite a bit of work. But by that time, uh, also Dorothy had set a, a record for women, and she accomplished 29 or 23 outside loops. But later in the year, in May of 1931, in fact, right before this special Great Lakes was built, they were at the Omaha Air Races. And there, they both set uh, records that stood for a long time. Dorothy did 62 outside loops continuously, um, which set the record. And, and that was the record that was held until 1989, I believe, uh, when Joanne Osterud broke the, uh, that record at the uh, North Bend um, airfare here oh, four, five, six years ago. Um, so that was a long standing record. And her logbook indicates that this was two hours and six minutes of flying time to do those 62 outside loops. And what's remarkable is that it's a it's basically a terminal velocity, velocity dive going straight down, and then you push negative, about three to four Gs negative coming around, and then up the top side all of the time doing this in, a, in an aircraft with a 90-horse Cirrus motor that didn't have an inverted system. So she had to keep the engine running with a wobble pump the whole time she's doing this exercise. They had rigged up a tank that was um, in, actually it was in the gear leg, so that when the airplane was upside down, this tank was above the engine, so it fed gravity. But you had to keep feeding that tank, because it was only a little one or two gallon tank, and uh, a most unusual operation. But you can imagine, two hours and six minutes of, you know, headlong dives down, pumping on the wobble pump, pushing three to four negative Gs up the other side. For, for over two hours. I mean, that was a um, uh, physically demanding task, uh, something that would uh, maybe a 20-year-old would want to do, but I don't think I would. <laughs> That's a lot of work. Uh, uh, she also did some other record things. One of them that they were counting was inverted snap rolls, and apparently she still holds the record of 56 inverted snap rolls, uh, outside snap rolls. Um, I don't know that anybody's ever counted, but uh, at least that's, that was in the record book at the time of 50, 56 inverted snaps. 
It was also obvious that Boltex and Dorothy were pushing, at that time, they were flying a stock Great Lakes that was just off the factory standard Great Lakes with not much modification to it at all. Apparently, Tex had been tinkering a little bit with these Great Lakes and adding an extra wire brace here. And, a, and a, I know they, they uh, um, put an extra brace on the fin to hold the fin up because they were doing snap rolls. And snap rolls are really tough on not only outer wing panels, but everything that sticks out, and particularly the rudder, because you're, you're kicking full rudder into the thing to make it snap, and full elevator. So uh, things were really wearing out. The, um, one of the mechanics reported after they got back down that the fabric on one of the wing panels was wrinkling. They had broken ribs. Uh, there were little aluminum ribs on wood spars, and they were coming loose. They were, they were breaking, and the fabric was being distorted uh, during the, you know, the strenuous aerobatic flights that Boltex and Dorothy were, were um, accomplishing in, a, in this basic stock airplane. And that's why, at this point in time, the Great Lakes Aircraft Corporation uh, built this special airplane with a lot of input from Tex, I'm sure. They had extra wires for negative flight and, and beefed up uh, tube structure in the front end of the airplane, uh, a stronger fin and rudder tail surfaces. At this, uh, in fact, the new ones were all steel tube welded as opposed to the earlier ones were aluminum with aluminum ribs riveted together. And that apparently just worked and worked itself until, uh, in fact, they did have a failure in one of those airplanes. And so the new one was really much better, much heavier, much stronger, and was able to withstand uh, those kinds of loads. It was also a, an interesting timing thing. We didn't really understand this much until we started looking at the records of the aircraft, but the airplane was completed in the end of May 1931, and Dorothy and Tex picked up the airplane. And then it was, only, and this is in Cleveland, Ohio, where the Great Lakes Aircraft Factory is. And right at about that time, the uh, premier event was lining up its uh, uh, air show performers. And that premier, premier event, of course, was the Cleveland National Air Races at Cleveland, which was also the home of the Great Lakes Aircraft Corporation. The, uh, the first time that they have, had ever offered a premier slot, a prime time slot, if you want, to a female aerobatic pilot was to Dorothy Hester for the 1931 uh, Cleveland Air Races. So she became one of the headline main liners for the event that year. And of course, it was in the hometown of Cleveland, and she was going to be performing with the Great Lakes. It all really fit that they that Great Lakes would benefit hugely, uh, immensely from having Dorothy, young Dorothy, she was 20 years old at the time, uh, putting on an air show in the Great Lakes that they had given to her. So, so it was a lot of publicity involved in, in that uh, operation. Um, and of course, at the, at the air show, uh, both Tex and Dorothy were, uh, were the stars of the show. And uh, as we have found out, Tex did the narrative on the microphone. And uh, we have a, a tape of the 1939 air tour, which shows Tex at the microphone describing uh, a flying event. Unfortunately, we don't have the, the audio portion of it. But you can tell by the, by the um, gyrations and gymnastics and, the, and the, the moves of Tex that he was a really good uh, announcer over the radio. Uh, we have some uh, newspaper accounts of his uh, uh, voice being uh, uh, unmistakable and, and remarkable in how he described these uh, air events. Well, he was on the microphone one of the days that uh, uh, Dorothy was up doing her aerobatic routine. Then her final uh, show-stopping event for the, for the day was to do the inverted spin. So she climbed up to probably three or 4,000 feet set up her spin. Well, the next act that was supposed to come in was um, an airplane towing three gliders behind it on tow lines. And that aircraft was supposed to come across the field at oh, about 2,000 feet. And at some point in time, cut the gliders loose, and they were all going to fly around and land. Well, unfortunately, that airplane got there just a little bit early. And so as Tex is describing her inverted spin, here comes this aircraft towing the three gliders right through the middle of the field. 
Dorothy goes into her spin, and I'm sure if you're upside down and spinning, you're not exactly cognizant of everything that's flying, particularly underneath you. It's hard to see things underneath you. She ended up spinning right through the middle of this formation of gliders. And she made it. She got right through it, and she pulled out. And apparently, Tex just about fainted when he saw what was going on. Uh, he became, he got speechless. There's no way to describe what was either going to happen or not happen. Um, and of course, he was hoping that she would survive this. But it looked like disaster all over. So that was um, probably Dorothy's most electrifying stunt uh, that she ever performed, and, and quite by mistake, I'm sure. That, that year also, 1931, with their brand new airplane, 315Y, they toured the country that year. And I think during August, September, and October, and maybe into November a little bit, they, in three months' time, they covered 38 states, doing air shows in, in almost every city that they landed in. And they were um, covered by the newspapers. In fact, we have a, a good collection of the newspaper clippings uh, from the Tex Rankin collection that we the museum has of these events and just if you know city after city all over the United States uh, in fact in North Carolina at Charlotte North Carolina in it was in October of 1931 uh, Tex set the the uh, I guess it was a long-standing record because I think it has been broken but he accomplished 130 outside loops uh, with with 315Y was also at this event that Wiley Post was one of the uh, featured uh, flyers that was there. And uh, watching Dorothy fly, he asked her if he could get a ride and, and reciprocated, of course, by giving her a ride in the, in the Winnie Mae. So they did a nice speed dash across the field at 200 miles an hour or whatever. And to which Dorothy was heard to comment, that's fun, let's do that again. Well, then it came time to reciprocate, and Dorothy took Wiley Post up in the Great Lakes and did an outside loop, at which time, when Wiley got back down on the ground, he said, I did one outside loop, my last outside loop, and my only outside loop. I don't want to do that ever again. <laughs> so uh, I think Dorothy was the winner on, on that one. Uh, kind of an interesting uh, event. <clears throat> There, there's also in, in between, and it's interesting because we have copies of some of these notes. While they were flying from town to town and city to city, Tex, always being the instructor with a student, was passing notes back and forth between the cockpit holes uh, with Dorothy in the front, or maybe she was in the back flying, always giving instruction, little notes about how to navigate and where we are now and, and how to accomplish this. and taking care of the drift and look at the smoke from that factory and, and how to change your angle to do this or that and how to, uh, how to navigate and what the weather was going to be doing and all of these type of things, even such practical things as um, you be careful when you unbuckle your seat belt in an open cockpit biplane. It could drop out bef underneath you before you could do anything. So he was always thinking safety, always thinking um, of, as being an instructor with a, with a young, she was 20, 21 years old at this time, and probably didn't have that many hours of actual flying time, probably in the neighborhood of 100 to 200 hours flying time, because almost all of her flying time was dedicated to either doing aerobatics in air shows or practicing the aerobatics. And very little, there wasn't much time for anything else. So unfortunately, time marches on, and uh, Dorothy was um, uh, being uh, courted by a young pilot who also had a Great Lakes airplane at the time, and so they decided to marry. It was 1934. Um, her flying school was slowing down. There weren't enough students. The Depression was really on. Um, her husband had a good job with a publishing company here in uh, Portland, and so they decided to get married and sell the airplane, and she basically retired from aerobatic flying. And so, it, uh, because the airplane was hers and hers to sell, she sold it, and it went to a, a pilot up in Montana who had been familiar with Tex and knew Tex and Dorothy, and he had always had an interest in, in acquiring 315Y. Uh, we have an interesting narrative of that flight uh, with Dorothy and her husband, Robert, uh, flying the airplane up to Great Falls. They'd already received the check 
uh, the check was in the mail and apparently it had arrived and so they were delivering an airplane that in a sense wasn't even wasn't theirs anymore and they had <coughs> as many misadventures on that flight from Portland to Great Falls as anybody would want to have in a lifetime but they made it and they got the airplane there and uh, Al Gillis the operator at Great Falls Montana was very happy to see his airplane immediately jumped in it and took it around the patch and said you bet it's great even though Robert Hofer, uh, Dorothy's husband, admitted that when they delivered the airplane, the only instrument that was left in the airplane that worked was the oil pressure gauge. Most everything had been broken just or worn out from extreme flying and aerobatics and, and uh, by 1934, maybe not quite as much maintenance as should have been done on the airplane. But they got it there safely, successfully, and so, uh, Dorothy is retired. She's um, not flying anymore. The airplane is sold. But Tex, of course, continued to fly. And he was uh, always the air show pilot, always the performer, always the crowd pleaser. And after a while, um, in searching around for new aircraft, he, he came upon the Ryan STA as being an excellent aircraft, something that he could do in his air shows and, and, um, and in competition aerobatics. So he had a new Ryan STA that he flew from about 1934 on. And in 1935, I think it was, or 36, he won the what was at that time the U.S. Aerobatic Championship in the Ryan. And in 1937, which was probably the highlight or the zenith of his career, he won what was considered at that time the International Aerobatic Competition over um, performers from Europe, uh, Germany, uh, Let's see, I think there was one from England. Um, let's see, another fellow from Cuba was there. There were a number of, of outstanding, in fact, the, the world's best collection of aerobatic pilots, and he won the competition in his Ryan STA. It was also apparent, even, uh, in fact, from the owner of that particular aircraft, which is still extant, um, they were, Tex was bending that airplane a little bit also. It really wasn't able to withstand uh, the rigors of the aerobatic competition the Tex was putting the airplane through. So about that time Tex started to look around for something else, some other way to come up with a better airplane. The competition was keen and he wanted to stay on top of the pile and he needed an airplane that could do some of the things that he was seeing some of the other airplanes, particularly the German built Bucher was an excellent aerobatic airplane. Uh, it, it stayed in the, in the zone nicely, it didn't go too fast, but it could still go up and come down and do all the aerobatics and snap rolls and, and so forth extremely well, in fact probably better than the STA uh, could hope to do. So in his efforts to find an airplane that would equate to the German Bucher and being the staunch American that he was and not wanting to fly a, a German built aircraft, remember this is about 1937 or 8 and things are happening in Europe and uh, we, we have a letter in the record um, in the records on the Great Lakes of Tex writing to the CAA requesting permission to make all these changes on this particular airplane because he did not want to fly that German built airplane <laughs> and it was very obvious what he was talking about. But the airplane that he came back to, that he decided had to be the one with a few modifications that would do the job, was the Great Lakes, and in, in particular, Great Lakes NC315Y, which was still up in Montana. So in 1936, Tex got back up to Montana and bought that airplane and got it back down to Southern California where he now lived because he was um, teaching Hollywood stars how to fly and his his air show routine, he had uh, uh, created a group of flyers called the Hollywood Aces, and they had four, five, six airplanes that they used in their troop uh, when they went to all these air shows and fly-ins <coughs> around the country. And so he got the Great Lakes back, took it to the Tim Aircraft uh, Corporation in Glendale, California, and had them modify the airplane. They went to four ailerons. They went to a single place aerobatic airplane. They covered over that front cockpit. They put a 150 horse supercharged Manasco on the front end of it, uh, changed some of the other things, added more wires for negative flying and up, upside down inverted flight. Um, and several other changes, did a little bit better job with the fuel system. He added smoke, um, all kinds of things that would be typical of what we would think of as an air show aircraft nowadays. 
um, he incorporated into the Great Lakes. And at that time, when it came rolling off of the, of, uh, the Tim uh, factory uh, field, it was known then as the Rankin Special because it had really changed a lot. And no longer did it uh, really qualify as an NC aircraft. So it was licensed NX315Y. And then Tex began to show that airplane. He used it in Hollywood promotions, uh, the movie Men With Wings. Um, that was painted all over the side of the airplane, and he did a lot of the flying for that movie. Uh, he also, by the time the World's Fair came up in San Francisco, had painted the airplane into what, uh, what we think of now when we look at the Great Lakes and Tex Rankin as the standard red, white, and blue air show paint scheme with Tex Rankin on one side, uh, right side up, and then on the opposite side, Tex Rankin upside down, so that when he rolled upside down and flew past the crowd line, there was Tex right side up uh, for all of them to see. And that was the standard scheme that was on the airplane for the next uh, oh, four or five years. <clears throat> and he performed uh, constantly and continuously all through the summer of, oh, from about 37, 38, 39, 40, uh, was doing air shows all over the place. We have with us, uh, and we'll want to show that, an excellent tape of the 1939 air tour. And you'll see some aerobatic flying with Tex in the Great Lakes, and also the Ryan STA, because he still had the Ryan. And uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that later. But by and large, 315Y was his favorite mount. And he, he flew, literally flew the wings off of that thing. Well, World War II approached, and, and uh, so there were other things to do at that point in time. Tex moved on to Tulare, started the Rankin School of um, Aeronautics, and trained uh, over 10,000 cadets right uh, prior to and during World War II. Uh, uh, and of those over 10,000 cadets, uh, 12 of them became aces. You, you had to know that probably the, the folks that flew through Rankin School knew a little bit more about aerobatics than some of the other uh, cadets who went through similar uh, flying schools, uh, civilian flying schools around the country. Uh, and in fact, the leading ace of World War II, Richard Bong, was a Rankin graduate. Um, and Tex, uh, always the air showman and always wanting to stay uh, on top of his aerobatics, after each graduating class would finish, and I think they were there for about two to three months, 10, 12 weeks, when the graduating class was finished and done, he would jump in the Great Lakes, fire up, and go up and write in smoke the class number, like 43J or 44B or whatever the class number was. He would write that in smoke and then proceed to do an air show routine in the, in the Great Lakes. So all of the cadets, I'm sure in their military, I hope they were standing at ease. It would be a long stand at attention to watch the air show. But uh, he would put on quite an air show. And sometimes he would often come down jump in another airplane and do another show, perhaps even a steerman. But I, we know that he also had a stock Great Lakes that he flew also. I, I think that was as a contrast. After doing an air show in the specially built airplane, he would go up and do the same routine again, pretty much, in a stock airplane, just to show the cadets that now, you know, just because this was a special airplane and, the, and you thought that this only could be done in a special airplane, think again. If you really know how to fly, really know how to do your aerobatics keenly, you can do it in another airplane that's perhaps not as powerful, not as strong, if you're good. And uh, Tex was good. Well, as uh, the war ended, and of course, and, and time marches on, and Tex, after the war, became uh, just a, a kind of an FBO operator, instructor, and aircraft salesperson. And one of the airplanes that he picked up as a sales um, aircraft was the Republic CB. And unfortunately, that was his undoing. In Klamath Falls in 1947, just on a routine business flight, um, apparently an engine failure or partial failure uh, did not allow him to clear some wires. And uh, uh, all, all four people on board went in, and Tex was killed. And so now we have, um, you know, one of the one of the people is no longer in the picture, but uh, Dorothy, of course, was still alive. And the Great Lakes, after uh, Texas' death, uh, his widow Shirley sold the airplane, and it went through a number of owners um, before arriving in Oklahoma in the early '60s, where a gentleman there uh, changed the engine, took out the Manasco, put in an IO 470 Continental of 225 to 250 horsepower, 
changed the landing gear from the typical Great Lakes gear to Cessna spring gear. They changed a bunch more things, added some more ribs, um, and, and continued to try to improve on the Great Lakes. But bear in mind that many of the parts and pieces that were in this airplane were the old 1930 original factory 90 horse Cirrus powered parts. The wing ribs, of which we have a rib down there, and you can see on that one that people over the years have been attempting to beef the thing up, strengthen even such small things as the ribs. But in 1968, one of the last owner of the aircraft was um, doing a preliminary performance for the TV cameras for an upcoming air show when in, in an effort to do a square loop, he pulled too hard and the airplane literally broke. And the top right wing failed and the airplane crashed, of course, and killed the pilot. And at that time, it was uh, when, when Dorothy Hester, who was still alive, heard about this, she was, um, you know, j just um, devastated with the news that the airplane that she had loved so much and had flown so many uh, happy memories with was gone. And she thought that at that point in time, the airplane, in fact, it was declared that it was destroyed, though a lot of the aircraft actually survived the accident. Uh, she was devastated and thought that that was probably the end of, of that. And with Tex gone, and it, then there was a long period of time until Dorothy died in, in 1986, I think it was, um, a few years back, and that pretty much ended the chapter of 315Y and the two special pilots who flew that airplane. But as things are wont to be sometimes, and as we like to um, think that it was a, an awful good event to have happen, a, a fellow back in Pennsylvania saw the remains of the Great Lakes in the junkyard and he was going to try to rebuild another Great Lakes. During that period of time, you could buy the plans for, the, for a production, basically the production Great Lakes, but you could home build a new Great Lakes. And he found, he got all the pieces and parts and scrounged everything up, decided he would build himself a new Great Lakes based on the pattern of what was there. But I'm, I'm not even sure that he knew exactly what the history of that particular aircraft was. Um, he just wanted the parts. Well. That project languished. He never finished it. Uh, it went through a couple of owner, other owners. And then finally another fellow, tracking, going back to see what the history of this airplane was, realized, wait a minute, this is the old Tex Rankin, Dorothy Hester, Great Lakes. And at that point in time, since he did not want to complete the project, it got advertised in trade plane And um, we saw that and responded to the ad and were able to put together a deal so that the Oregon Aviation Museum could acquire all of the remaining parts and pieces of, of Tex and Dorothy's Great Lakes. And that's what you have out here today. Now much of what you see there has been totally brand, uh, made brand new. The fuselage parts that we have off the old uh, fuselage, there's just not enough there to do uh, a new fuselage. But the museum in the restoration effort will go ahead and build new components that, that will be airworthy so that the airplane can fly. And we will also integrate as many of the old original parts as we can, and we do have quite a few, into the aircraft as long as they're airworthy and, and safe. We'll try to integrate just as much as we can of the old airplane. And the things that we can't salvage, of course, we can use as, uh, for dis display purposes. All of this takes money, of course, and the museum, uh, through many friends and, and associates and, and relatives, I might add, of Tex Rankin uh, and of Dorothy Hester, um, and a number of the Rankin Academy uh, graduates who went through World War II uh, have uh, donated a lot of money for this project. And we, we are now at that point where we have got all the funds together to acquire the airplane, and now we want to get started on the restoration process. Um, and so, uh, for those of you here today, if you would uh, uh, like to participate in this, uh, there's brochures and little forms that you can fill out. And some of you, perhaps, here today have actually seen Tex fly as a, a kind of an adjunct to, uh, it was almost like a uh, sit down, think about how to raise money situation. We came upon the idea that uh, many people have actually seen Tex fly. Uh, I know we have one here today who saw Tex fly. Uh, Al Grell, as a young man, uh, saw Tex fly at the, it was Albany, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. 
And we have about 70 members around the United States now who have joined the ISAW Tex Fly Club. Not that it's a big official thing, it's more of a, a remembrance of the good, the good things that you saw when you were young. And many of these people, from the responses that we've gotten from the ISAW Tex Fly Club, many of these people tell heartwarming stories of uh, you know, saving their money, pedaling their bike out to the airport, getting there very early, getting to see Tex and the airplanes, and then watching him fly. And as young 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 year olds, uh, you know, watching with their mouth wide open as uh, um, Tex flew his routine, and many of them at that point in time said, I want to be a pilot. And, and we do know that because Tex and Dorothy both flew in front of thousands and thousands of people, that many people were inspired either to become pilots or at least be more interested in aviation. Um, and not only their contribution just in inspiring people, but <coughs> their flying, their techniques, their processes uh, in which they um, in fact, like as in Texas' case, how he taught aerobatics. In fact, his whole rank and uh, training manual that he had written was was based on years and years of this type of flying, and the experience that he had gained over these years. So, we have several avenues. If you're one of those lucky people, uh, you can join. It's a $25 donation. You get a nice certificate and a nice photo that was given to uh, one of the folks who saw Tex fly. Um, and it's got Texas autograph on it. It's a nice, um, what is it, 8 by 10 uh, black and white copy of that photo. Uh, it's a nice remembrance to put up on your wall. I've seen several of them now uh, on, on folks' walls, and they're very proud of that. It's really interesting to see the response that we've had. But if you could help in any other way, we would really appreciate it. So stop by the booth, uh, grab a form, and um, Pat yourself on the back when you make that contribution by saying that you've helped in a very special way to bring this remarkable airplane and, and the life of these two remarkable pilots uh, back to life again. I'd like to show a couple videos uh, if we've got a little bit of time uh, and maybe if we've got some time we could even answer some questions. We've got uh, footage <coughs> of a couple of really um, remarkable um, tapes. One, the first one I want to show is Dorothy Hester doing some flying. Um, apparently, Tex took Dorothy down to uh, Southern California in, uh, feels like we got a video already in there. Oh, there we go. Uh, Tex and Dorothy went down to Southern California and uh, put on a little air show routine and the Hearst uh, Movie Tone Company um, did a, um, you know, one of those little four or five minute uh, photo sessions with, with Dorothy and having her do aerobatics and I'm sure it was a little clip in between the, the movies that were being shown at the time. Let's see if we can get this. Got to operate. <laughs> well, we have a an ailing VCR. Hmm. We're going to play. Good deal. I'm not sure who did the uh, labeling here for this. Uh, I think they could have had another choice in words. Unfortunately, we don't have the audio. I know the last thing she says is, I, and I hope you like my flying. She's 19 years old and looks like a young 19-year-old uh, would do. The camera was mounted right over the, the uh, um, front cockpit on this Great Lakes. It was a stock Great Lakes and one of the early ones that uh, Tex had, 812K is the end number on it. Um, and 
I'm not sure if this is the one or another one, 820K, that they used uh, at Omaha to set all the records right before 315Y got built. But you can notice by the, um, she starts out with a couple slow rolls and then does a couple of loops. Um, and those slow rolls are pretty slow and there's a few of them later on that get even slower. And if you watch the video carefully, you can see rudders and elevators and ailerons all moving in concert. She's actually wearing a necklace, and you'll see, and sometimes when, the, when there's negative, uh, negative G's, negative load, her little necklace will come right up on her chin. One of the most interesting um, aerobatic uh, portion, there's her necklace right there is this series, and they really missed it. She rolls inverted, stops the airplane, and then pushes forward, and then pushes into a snap roll, an outside snap, and she got at least two outside turns out of that snap roll. Unfortunately, with those big heavy cameras that they had back in 1929, it was hard to aim and follow things. And so this air-to-air -air, um, work was not exactly a perfected science at that point in time. It's too bad that we miss some of that, but uh, that kind of looks like a hammerhead, what we would consider a hammerhead nowadays. There's another snap roll. That's one and a half, by the way, and she stops it inverted. That's something that I've seen a few Oshkosh Air Show people not even quite get right. They don't stop right on the one and a half. And there's another slow roll. Well, I, I think that uh, I think that they did mirrors and tricks and things in the movie houses. I think they shot it once with the camera right side up and once with it upside down, possibly. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, Dorothy was just an excellent aerobatic pilot, and and she really didn't exactly have a lot of skills in some of the other areas. I. I heard from her husband that she was a lousy navigation person. She couldn't get from A to B without getting lost twice. Hester family. And I'm not sure exactly where they got it from, but I know it's some historical footage, and perhaps the Oregon Historical Society has this also. This is a 1928 effort to set an endurance record. The Tex and his brother Dick, there's Tex there in the sweater. <coughs> uh, they attempted to set this endurance record, and they had a uh, what looks like a Stinson SM7 um, and a smaller Stinson, uh, this is probably an SM2 or an SM8. Uh, obviously, they were going to use shell oil or shell gasoline, and the hose that they had in their hand was going to come through the top of the cabin there on the other, on the uh, endurance ship. And uh, they would do in flight refueling, as was typical of the day. And all the dignitaries are there. There's Texas' brother Dick. Um, he also had another brother, Dudley. This is the full race Armstrong starter. I'm uh, impressed with their technique. I'm not sure that the editing on this footage is all that correct because we see him take off and then we come right back down to the ground again to do some more of the preparation work. Look at all the cars in the background uh, coming to the airport to see this. Where is this? Well, I don't know exactly. It's one of the Portland fields that he used. Uh, on that map that we have, there's about four or five flying fields, and you could probably track it pretty accurately by the fact that this was 1928, which field he was using at the time in 1928. It's probably where it was. <clears throat> we have those maps at the booth down here. This looks like quite an ordeal, getting cinched up in that parachute. I'm not sure if they were having fun or enduring pain. Uh, 
unfortunately, uh, there's the Rankin family, wealth, um, his wife, Shirley, and then there's two daughters, uh, Carolyn and Wilma, who I've both met. And then I think the young fellow that's in Texas' um, right arm there was there, his son Dale, who was killed in World War II in a P-38 um, crash, actually shot down. Both Carolyn and Wilma have uh, not only sent us a lot of money, um, which we appreciate immensely, of course, but also uh, old photo albums, uh, old scrapbooks, a number of photos that have not been seen before, uh, family photos that they have had, uh, and several other things. Strangely enough, uh, and there's a picture on the board out there of Tex um, with all his trophies in the Ryan STA. The family could not tell us where any of the trophies are. There, there must be 50 trophies in that picture. And he won hundreds of awards, cups, plaques, and various other things. And uh, they think that one of the cousins or somebody has some of those things, but they have all drifted away over the years. Nobody really took that much attention to it, and it all got away from them. When he was dropping into that tube, was that a recorder? Or I, I, I'm not sure exactly. Like he was reading a script or something. I, I think that it was a recording barograph with a voice oh. like a uh, dictaphone. I see. And, the, and of course, for an official flight, you'd have to carry a barograph. And I think that's what that was, but no one has really clarified that to me. But apparently, it got off the ground, and off they, off they went for, I think the longest they were up was like 50 or 60 hours. They had engine problems. and refueling problems and all kinds of trouble, and never ever really did. Welcome to Roseburg, Oregon, 1939, summer of 39. We have several I Saw Tex Flight Club members who were there and uh, got to see um, Tex fly. If you remember, the uh, Oregon's aviation history has always uh, been dotted with some special events, and these air tours uh, they had tours back in, I think, about 1929, 30, 31. There were a couple of them back then. And then later in 37 and 39, they had some rather large tours. I think the 39 tour was probably the largest tour um, that had ever been held. And I'm not sure exactly how many aircraft were involved, but it, probably 30, 40, or 50 airplanes. Even the governor flew in, and you'll see a 337 uh, Boeing what is that, mainliner? What did they call that thing? Uh, but the governor, yeah, yeah, it's one of the early uh, Boeing transports. Uh, now here's Tex in front of 315Y. There's a good picture of, um, of the Manasco-powered Great Lakes in its red, white, and blue configuration. Uh, you'll notice air tour participants all wore a little beret with a little special Oregon Air Tour 39. Uh, and the museum is privileged to have several of these caps. The footage uh, and the camera, uh, the cameraman here was Dr. Michael Salt from uh, Lakeview, Oregon, and uh, he participated in a couple of these tours. There you are. <laughs> there you go. There's the flagship. Yeah. And apparently the governor, is that that Ranky Shangle yeah. instrument uh, firewall or uh, These guys windshield? They were flying antique airplanes. They were flying state of the art aircraft. They were flying brand new airplanes at the time. In fact, one of the Fairchilds is in, and you can also see right there one of the logos. All the aircraft, or many of the aircraft that participated, had a logo on the side of them Oregon Air Tour, and then a number on it, whichever number they were assigned. Uh, this is apparently Jimmy Doolittle's uh, Lockheed Vega that he used uh, when he was. Um, on Shell Oil Company's staff. Uh, this is uh, Dr. and Mrs. Sharp from um, Klamath Falls. We, having shown this uh, tape a number of times, have s slowly been starting to identify some of the people that are involved in this. Always had to have the parachute jumper. Look at that nice tri motor. Boy, were they doing a good ride business that day. This Curtis Wright Jr., this little pusher, is still alive and well. Um, I've been tracking all of the airplanes that performed in the Hollywood Aces show, um, trying to find out what happened to them, if any of them are left. 
And um, that Curtis Wright Jr. is one of the survivors. The little J3 cub that they have that they used, it doesn't show up in the records um, after uh, World War II. It seems to have disappeared. Texas famous inverted spin. And here's the Great Lakes doing some of his <coughs> typical air show routines. Looks like he's being shot right out of the ground in some of those. <coughs> He does have nice, uh, if, if you look at some of the things that aerobatic people look at, he does have nice lines. The, the 45s are 45, the, the verticals are true perpendicular from the ground. Um, <clears throat> he, he knew what he was doing, all right. I, it wasn't quite the polished style of um, international aerobatic competition that we think of today. Uh, nonetheless, it was very good. There he is taxing out in a cloud of dust. <clears throat> We've been looking at things like the paint scheme. The stripes on the bottom of the wings were straight across, and the stripes on the top surfaces of the wings are striped, or, or a slanted back sunburst style. Uh, we're going to try to duplicate all of those things uh, in the restoration process so it looks exactly like it would have looked right here. And we're still looking for a volunteer to do these air show routines, right? Uh, <laughs> perhaps because of some of the historical significance of the fact that uh, uh, they had air tours back in the 30s, our Oregon Antique and Classic Aircraft Club has uh, reinitiated the air tours, and every other year we go on an air tour. I think the first one was 84. Is that the first one, 84? So uh, every two years since then, we've been going on tours around the state. Uh, sometimes it's been something of a loose attempt to duplicate the route that um, the, like the 37 and the 39 tours took, but other times it's been more freelance. Sometimes you just can't duplicate landing in the cow pasture that they did uh, back in the 30s. <clears throat> Tex also apparently uh, was one of the first innovators into colored smoke, and his uh, daughter was telling us that the, uh, it, was, uh, it wasn't the CIA, but it was some high Air Force, or well, Army at that time, Army Air Force group that was doing secret studies uh, contacted Tex about doing smoke writing in the sky because they were thinking of some type of uh, psychological warfare or something along that line uh, over Europe at the time and thinking that this might be a way to do it. And uh, I don't think there was much follow-up on it, but, but at least the contact was made because they recognized the Tex was the guy who knew the most about smoke writing and colored smoke and how to make it and what was in it and what it did and what it didn't do and uh, kind of an interesting sidelight to uh, Tex's career. <coughs> Some of these photos I think were taken at um, another air show probably at either Medford or um, Lakeview. There's our skydiver with his bag of flour that continues on. Not exactly the parachutes that we look at today, huh? <coughs> <laughs> Pretty healthy rate of descent, too. That was a smack. Yeah, there's the Oregon Air Tours logo. That's number 23. Maybe that's the skydiver now back in, <laughs> back in uniform here. That's an old Stearman, by the way, that they were standing in front of. Now, is this Lakeview or is this um, Klamath Falls? I think Klamath Falls. 
the more I've looked at the hills around it, here's another airplane that's alive and well, the Melberg MG2. It's just been restored by a gentleman up in Washington. Uh, it's been changed a little bit, but still retains the, that same configuration. And uh, boy, that's a hot little airplane. I sat in that thing uh, on the way back from Oshkosh this summer, and it's blind as a bat, and it's all engine. <laughs> There's not much else. It's like a, a pit special with a 165 Warner on the front of it. Here's a little cub that I mentioned uh, that apparently has disappeared. We do know that it was a 50 horse Franklin powered J3 cub. Uh, and we do have some good photos of it. Later on, Tex will be doing a narrative, and we think that he's probably doing the, the narrative to this routine because it just, uh, by his hand gestures and so forth, Oh, that cub must have had brakes, huh? To do that maneuver, had to have brakes. Now here's Tex in the Ryan. Doesn't look like it, but the top surface of the wings, and we'll see it when it's flying, the top surfaces of the wings are painted in the red, white, and blue uh, air show uh, Hollywood Aces sort of routine paint scheme. It looks like that Ryan could really wind up in a spin. Now I think we're going to get to the, the portion in here where he does his routine. It's obviously a, a two coke routine. And I just wish we had some audio for this. Can't you see the drunk farmer or the, uh, you know, whatever it is, uh, grandma in her first airplane ride, whatever the routine or uh, however they set it up, but you can see Tex really got into describing what was going on. Uh, we'd like to put together a, a better tape, and I think if we rework that and edit it a little bit, um, we can put that, the two, the airplane and the actions together a little bit better. We were mentioning new airplanes in Jumpner's um, series on a Fairchild, uh, it's a 24R9. There's a picture of the Oregon Air 2 lo logo. He has a photo of a brand new Fairchild 24, uh, and it's one of those airplanes that's on the tour. And there's a good shot of Tex. You can see the four ailerons on it, the high turtle deck. He's taken out that front cockpit. Uh, there's some extra wires and things uh, beefing it up. and uh, it. Uh, for its day, it was a really a, a root and tootin', rare and to go air show machine. I've noticed on one of these. That I'm not sure if we've seen this or not, but he he starts out with an inverted, um, or he goes into an inverted spin, and it looks for all the world like. If the maneuver that he uses to go into his inverted spin is what we now know as a Lomshevok. And I, and I think that uh, the name just hadn't been coined yet. As many of these maneuvers that pilots were doing during that era, they didn't have a name necessarily. They were just um, something like this particular uh, thing we know of it as a Cuban 8. He may have called it, you know, a horizontal reversal half loop with a half roll. Well. That doesn't sound very good, but I know when Len Povey was asked, what was that maneuver? He said, oh, that was just a Cuban 8. Well, Cuban 8 stuck. And uh, much like Lomshevok, that sticks. Um, whereas doing an inverted, uh, inverted outside snap on a, on a 60 degree vertical line doesn't have a good ring to describe a maneuver, or to have a name for a maneuver. But Tex knew all the maneuvers. Uh, since it was an air tour, I guess we get to tour a little bit past, I think, Mount Hood.
they did about uh, six to eight, ten cities uh, around the state of Oregon. Um, I think they did get up into Washington a little bit um, on their air tours. And our modern tours that the Antique Club takes uh, have branched down a little bit into Northern California even. Um, but we try to hit some of the same cities and do the same things. Here's another inverted spin. We also have an account uh, from a gentleman who's about 97 or 8 years old uh, who was invited to fly with Tex and the troop, uh, particularly when they performed down in California. And he had a fleet biplane at the time. And one day he said, Tex, how come you always, you always invite me to fly with, uh, with you? I'm not very good. And why would you ever want me to fly on your show? Tex just looked over at him with this slow drawl and said, it's because you make me look so good. <laughs> this same gentleman was also um, at one of the air shows, and they were talking about square loops and how to do square loops. And Tex was always doing his square loops from the top down. And this fella suggested to him, uh, Ray Varney was the fella's name, uh, who I've met, uh, quite an interesting character. He said, why don't you start him from the bottom? and uh, start inverted and go up. And uh, why don't you do it that way? And it uh, might be easier because when you do them from the top, you're always having trouble getting up the back side in a straight line and then coming across. You typically fall out of that thing. But maybe if you do it the other way, it would be easier. Well, it was some time past, and at the 1939 World's Fair, uh, Ray and his wife were at the uh, treasure up to the square loop by golly, Tech started at the bottom and did it the way Ray had suggested. And Ray said, said that he broke out laughing in the middle of this air show routine, and people kind of, you know, looked at him like, why are you laughing? And he shut up and decided, oh, excuse me, that wasn't quite the right thing to do. And his wife asked him later, why were you laughing? And, and he said, well, I, I taught Tex how to do that maneuver, and I, when I saw him do it the way I had suggested, I just couldn't help but start laughing. And uh, so, uh, interesting thing. But uh, that, I think that concludes our, probably our time is up. Do we have any, maybe there's a question or two? Uh, if not, we sure thank you for your time. And we hope you enjoyed this uh, rambling tour of two pilots and a special airplane.